This episode of the Golf Guru Show is sponsored by EnviedHemp.com. That's E-N-V-E-E-D Hemp.com. I'm happy to say that Enveed has been my choice for my CBD needs for almost three years now, and I can't begin to tell you how it's improved my life. Uh, They come in three formulas, clarity, relief, and relax. I typically take a clarity drop in the morning with my coffee to get me focused and ready to go for the day. Uh, Some relief for my aches and pains or inflammation after a run or a workout. And then I do a drop of relax before I go to bed that helps me get some of the best sleep that I've had in years. And my whoop band now tells me that it's definitely helping because my recovery scores have been higher than ever. Enveed Hemp CBD come in drops, roll-ons, and gummies. So you can take it however you choose. So go to enveedhemp.com and make sure you use the guru code guru20 for a 20% discount for life. You heard it right, 20% discount for life. CBD is a great supplement to keep you healthy and safe in these crazy times. So go get it. So let's get to today's episode. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise, but like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it. Now let's do this. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? Hello, all you chopsicles and hack and teaching pros. Welcome to episode 132 of the Golf Guru Show. I am your host, Jason Sutton, Director of Instruction at the beautiful Colleton River Club in Bluffton, South Carolina, and I am the Guru, where it is my mission to break down high performers in our teaching and coaching business, as well as successful people in all fields of study. Get them to share their stories, tools, and tactics that have made them successful, and then share it with all of you. And all that I ask in return is that you share this episode and the podcast with your friends and colleagues, and I hope that something that I've shared with you has benefited your coaching or your life in a positive way. Thank you so much for all the support of the podcast, and make sure you hit that purple subscribe button so you don't miss any future shows coming your way very soon. My guest this week is none other than the Dew Sweeper himself, Mr. Tony Ruggiero. Tony needs no introduction as he is one of the best coaches in the world. He is a Golf Magazine Top 100, Golf Digest Top 50, and coaches or has coached several tour players such as Lucas Glover, Tom Lovelady, Grayson Murray, and many other elite college and junior golfers. Please give Tony a follow on IG at The Dew Sweeper. He's a great follow and he's got several different avenues, also a YouTube channel and a coaching channel. IG that he's going to share with you at the end of this program. I've very much been looking forward to this conversation and having Tony on the show as he and I share a passion for many things like red wine, uh, but also helping and mentoring young coaches, uh, which we talk a lot about and he gives some great advice to young coaches out there. So pay attention. This conversation goes in many different directions, as you can imagine. Uh, Great stories from Tony and some really, really good nuggets and information that's going to help your teaching and coaching and get to know him a little bit better. So I hope you enjoy this fun and entertaining combo with my friend, the talented and brilliant Mr. Tony Ruggiero. Enjoy. Tony, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Thanks for taking the time. I know how busy you are, and I've been looking forward to this uh, for a long time, so I appreciate it, man. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's a good time. I'm kick, kicking off my Easter vacation, spring break down in Key West. So this, I'm down here for... I got a few hours of peace and quiet before everybody else gets here. I got me and the dog down here earlier today after a little teaching in my aunt, or South Florida. So I appreciate nice. you having me on and I've got my rum drink and I'm kicking off the holiday and I'm ready to go. Perfect. Yeah. I'm a little embarrassed because I'm actually drinking a seltzer right now because I'm trying to drop yeah, we, some weight. Not about that. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> that'll, that'll come back to hurt you there. <laughs> but we definitely have to maybe dig into some wine because I know we share that passion. Yeah, I do. I'd love some wine. I was just actually taking stock. We don't have a, we don't have much that's great down here right now, but uh, we got some stuff that's at least red that'll get the job done. But 
I hear you. So, so I've followed your career for a long time. Huge fan of your work. Um, fantastic coach and what you do with juniors and your tour players and, and enjoy your podcast. I but wish I think you the, tell my tour players that I wouldn't have got fired. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about that. I think that's a good subject, but um, I think the first time that we sort of met or even talked to one another is when I was on your, your radio show that you used way to back. do. Way back. Yeah. And I think it would be interesting to kind of dig into like how that happened. Um, always curious about, you know, the logistics of that yeah. and then how that led to your career now, if that, if you could share that story. Yeah. So, you know, the radio show was interesting and there's, there's a funny story with it. Um, you know, and I think for anybody, like you, you mentioned before we came on, you know, helping young teachers, which, uh, I respect a lot. I, I try to spend a lot of time giving back cause I've been very fortunate. Um, I mean, I've just been fortunate to have a bunch of the great teachers take an interest in me for whatever reason. And, and, you know, and I feel like, in this day and age, and maybe this is just part of turning 51 in a couple of weeks and getting old and being a curmudgeon. And like, you feel like, I don't know that enough people take time doing it, giving back as they used to. I think everybody's so caught up and putting their shit on. Am I allowed to cuss on here? Absolutely. So putting their shit on Instagram and Twitter and all that. And, you know, my old mentor, Hank Johnson, man, like if you would have put stuff on social media with him and never have taught anybody that's worth the shit, he'd have beat your brains out. He'd have been like, you don't deserve to put anything out there. And so that's kind of how I grew up, you know, uh, in the business. But, um, you know, I think that for a young teacher, it was a great opportunity. I, I was, you know, I'd kind of just started getting to where I was. Te- I mean, I was just teaching a bunch of local people. And you, you know how it is when you're starting out. You start teaching the local people that have some money or that are influential or that are good players, right? You know, you right. go through that phase before you start – just teaching good players or people that are coming to see you, you've got to own your own market first. I think that's, that's right. important for any teacher. Um, and there was a local, and I've always, you know, living in the Southeast, I've always, I've always been a big sports radio talk show guy, like when I would be driving or what, what have you. And um, there was a guy uh, in, in the Fort Walton area. And he had this sports talk. He'd been on Southern sports tonight and he, he calls me now later in the story, he goes to prison. Okay. Oh. So uh, I had nothing to do with that, but he, uh, he, he called me and he was like, I knew him from town and, and he was like, Hey, would you like to do this golf show on the local FM sports talk? And I was like, sure. I, mean, I had no clue about radio. I didn't know anything about it. And he said, well, what, what's it going to be? You know, what do this? And he's like, look, we'll split the advertising. I'll sell it, all this stuff. I mean, he didn't tell me any of the other stuff. And I was naive and, I had no clue. So I went and I mean, I remember sitting down and it was a live show. And I remember the first thing turned on. And I mean, an hour is a long time to talk when you don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, my good friend and one of my mentors, Mark Wood, uh, Woody's up there where you used to hang out now. That's right. And so Woody, Woody had the show. Uh, he had, he had the golf talk show on that was on, an hour before me. So I would drive to the studio and I'd listen to what he was talking about with late Tim Rosenfort and Randall Mel. And I would just copy half of the shit he talked about. <laughs> and I'd bring on Wayne Flint and uh, who we could tell some Wayne stories here in a minute. And, yeah. And, uh, and Hank Johnson, I'd bring them on and, you know, and I'd bring on guests and then, you know, I'm into it for like, I don't know, I'm into it for six, seven months. And I get this bill from the radio station for like five grand. And I called this guy, Scott's his name, and I'm like, hey, you know, it's the deal. He's like, oh, I'll take care of it, I'll take care of it, whatever. Anyways, as it turns out, he'd been collecting advertising, not paying the bill. Then he had a show that he sold more than 100% of stock in. And I'm teaching one day at Sandestin Beach Resort at Hank Johnson School, and the FBI comes and asks to interview me for it. So let, true, anyways, down the road, this guy goes to the pen. And, <laughs> uh, but that was the start of my radio career, and I left that station over that because there was it was a big – deal but i was very fortunate that one of my students and a great guy uh it down there at the beach ralph carroll's his name had been a big music promoter promoter in the music business and, and on the radio side and he was from nashville and muscle shoals he had a place in sandestin and we became friends and uh he was a mentor to me and anyways he he said hey i i think this show could be good but i think you need to make it all instruction because that's what you're good at and he was like, if you make it like Woody's show or you make it like the stuff on the golf channel, let's just talk about the tour this week. That's just another show doing that. Right. 
And we talked a little bit about how, you know, I think one of the best rated and the best shows the Golf Channel ever had was Golf Academy Live with Peter. 100%. Right? Um, yeah, I wish they'd bring that show. back. How many times do you – and I still have Peter on my show from time to time. Now, he's, he's you know, he's out there, right? But yeah, I've seen his tweets. Interview. And he's been <laughs> such a – he's been – but he's been a – he's actually been – he's been a mentor to me and that like there's been times earlier in my career where I bounced stuff off him because he was, I mean, look, when we were coming up, he was a legend, right? Yeah. He's still a legend. I've been on his show. It's like, yeah, he was yeah. amazing. And, uh, and I remember the first time he asked me to come on his show and I was so nervous, uh, you know, but he, he handled it great. Like he met, you know, and I, I realized then that the role of the host is always to make the guest look good. Right. And, uh, so it was, so, you know, Ralph helped me get back, make it an all about instruction. And Ralph had been in the business. He had some contacts and we got on the PGA tour radio. And that was, you know, that was my start. And I think, but, you know, while it was good for exposure and I think young people sometimes worry too much about exposure instead of just getting good. Right. Okay. I think, I think if you, if you worry about getting good and you make sure that you become good, I think the exposure and the money and all that stuff generally takes care of itself. I mean, I've done a lot of dumb shit and I've blown a lot of money. And, um, you know, it's that old saying, if, you know, I spent most of my money on women and wine, the rest I just wasted. So like, (laughs) you know, and that that's applicable, but, um, you know, going back to the radio, like, so more importantly than the exposure, which I'm not saying wasn't important, I had this opportunity to every week because it was on PGA tour radio to talk to some of the best teachers in the world. And I remember, you know, I got Jim McClain to come on all the time and, and Jim was, I mean, he's one of the consummate professionals. Right. And I learned a lot from Jim, Uh, you know, Randy Smith, who obviously, and you know, I've taught a junior school with Randy up in Nashville one time, but like I've had Randy on the radio and the Chuck cooks and, you can go down the list, you know, all of these guys came on. And so for whatever, it was a 10 minute segment basically, but for 10 minutes, four times a week, you know, 50 weeks a year, we did, I mean, probably ran a few reruns. So 46 times a year. So like I had a one-on-one conversation with a teacher that was light years better than me. And while the audience I think benefited, I benefited the most. And so, um, you know, and, and, and I also think that through doing it, you build these relationships and you build these relationships with teachers like you have, and you've done such a great job that you build the relationships with those teachers and you, you have sounding boards and you get information and, you know, uh, so that was, so, you know, and then I did the, yeah, I did the radio for, I think we were close to 15 years or so. And then it ended like all good things, but, but it, to be told, truth be told, I was ready for it to end. Like that's a long run that's a long time doing something. Yeah. And Ralph was a great business partner. Uh, and he produced all the shows and, and he was awesome. But like at the end, I think, you know, at the end, my career had gotten to a different point. I mean, I was teaching, you know, on tour a bunch and, you know, I was working with Lucas Glover at the time and, mm-hmm. you know, Smiley was playing good. I mean, there, you know, there were a lot of, so I was on the go and it became, you know, your, your time becomes okay. different. And, and, and also, you know, Ralph was unbelievable in that he expect wanted to be perfect. And it's hard to make stuff perfect and live up to what you want to do. Uh, my dog's coughing over here, but I can uh, hear him. <laughs> yeah. Chip shot. That's my dog, Chip shot. He's famous. Right. But, uh, you know, so, um, you know, it was, t- I think it was time. And then that's where actually Lucas Glover is the one that gave me the idea for the podcast. I was down there with him. I think I was staying at his house and I had, I think I'd gone to the medalist that day with Tom Lovelady. And I was back at his house and uh, they told me we were going off PGA tour radio. And he said like, man, like everybody, he listens to these podcasts. I, at that point I'd never listened to a podcast, right? Really? I listened, okay. I listened to classic rock and roll and Jimmy Buffett music and Island music when I'm driving and little sports talk. And I didn't really listen to podcasts. Hmm. And I was like, well, what's a podcast? So he, we, anyways, I kind of knew, but I found out that like I could do one. And Cordy Walker, Golf Science Lab, I know you know Cordy. Yep, yep. Cordy and I had done a, some stuff instructional for video and different things. And, you know, I bounced off Cordy and we started the podcast like 
I don't know, two weeks later, just started the tour coach. So, uh, does so he was, do all your like production all stuff? Production. And I mean, yeah. he's been great, you know, God, I may and, need to reach out to him. That's what I'm struggling with. This happened to do it all. It's tough. It's, it's hard. Right. Yeah. And, uh, but he's, I think, you know, that's a topic for another thing. He's done so sure. much during COVID with real estate and he's got a big business up there, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, so the podcast has become something different than the radio and, uh, but, you know, the radio show was the start of the Dew Sleepers, and, and I'll tell this story. So, um, you know, my grandfather and my dad taught me to play golf, no different than most – a lot of people listening to us. But my grandfather was like my idol growing up. Uh, he looks just like, looked just like me, little Italian guy. Um, he retired to Pinehurst, okay, when he was little. He retired. He'd worked in the Pentagon, worked, you know, in D.C., and – he took him and a group of guys went every year to Pinehurst and played golf a couple times a year. And, and then he retired there to Southern Pines. And I used to go spend all summer there with him. And I would just walk this little nine hole called Knollwood fairways there on the outside. Yeah, the I know where that is. Right? So I would just walk that little track all the time. And I'd go play with him at Midland farms was right down the road. That was a little mm-hmm. nine hole place. You could play twice. And then we you know once a week or whatever, we'd go to Pinehurst and play at buddies and, what have you. But so I'm older. And when the opportunity came to do this show, I had just read James Dodson's book, you know, about the dew sweepers and life lessons. And probably because of my grandfather and all of that, um, you know, I just liked that name. And I mean, it was one of those deals where if I'd ever thought that the thing would have stayed on the air more than two weeks, I would have come up with something better. I think that's uh, great. Yeah. I was going to ask you how that, how it it got started. So it was, uh, you know, it was from James Dodson's book. I had James on the show early on and, uh, you know, uh, and, and then like, it is what it is. And you know how it is like, yeah, it, it becomes who you are a little bit. And then the brand. I, can, I can remember walking off putting greens and stuff. And, I mean, I've been at a major and walked off a green and somebody say, Hey, do sweeper, you know, and you're like, who yeah. the hell? you know, and so, you know, and one of, you know, and this is a lesson for another thing, you know, one of, you know, I, you know, sometimes you make good decisions, bad decisions. And, you know, one of these ventures I was on, you know, people towards the end of my deal, you know, like at Frederica, people wanted me to change from do sweepers to my name and for branding and all that. And I was just like, you know, I'm just not going to do that. Right. I mean, and it may sound corny or whatever, but like everybody knows who the hell you are now. Right. right? Yeah. And there was also, you know what? And then to beyond that, there was also a really good reason for why I named it. Right which I think is, it was important to me and always will be important. So yeah. anyway, so that's the radio show story. So I don't know that that's worth anybody listening to, but, that, but that, that's how it happened. And, and so now I'm doing the podcast and I've enjoyed it because I I'm very creative by nature coming up through high school. I actually was very big into theater and acting. Oh, um, wow. Didn't and, know uh, that one. Yeah. And I was, uh, you know, contemplated for a short period of time, possibly, going to school for that um obviously was better at golf and, and all that and uh uh anyways i just uh the create the the ability to do whatever you want interview somebody whenever you want talk about what you want or yeah. if you're at dinner with three people and you've had a bottle of wine and you're talking about something good and you go hold on let's record this like i like that and i, I also I think that people people like that right people yeah. like being inside the ropes or having access to stuff. And I think people like people like you that are very genuine and come across sincere. So anyway, so that's what I've done. And, you know, and it also is easier to do with, there's not necessarily as much time constraints, right? Like, so right. I'm on the road for a week. I mean, I can, or two weeks, I, you know, I mean, I don't have to put one out if I don't want it. Right. right. So, so it's good. Yeah. So, it's, it's, so it fits me better. So anyway, no, that's, that, that's great. No, I think you, I you think answered about four <laughs> questions that, not but really I think have. any young teacher, <laughs> like any young teacher has been teaching three, four, five years, like if, especially if you're not like in New York or Chicago or Charlotte, right? Where, But like where they have local sports talk. I mean, they need content, right? right? And you can go and you can buy an hour of time, say it's a thousand bucks and go sell. Not that hard to sell a thousand dollars worth of advertising to four or five people you teach. And 
cover the cost, but promote yourself and then bring other teachers on and learn. I think it's a great vehicle that people overlook. And I know radio to a certain extent with all the stuff going on like this and stuff is going away, but in small markets, it's still pretty big. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So let's dig into some teaching stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, most people know your backstory and thanks for, thanks for telling that story because it answered a bunch of different questions that I already had. So you're such a professional. Um, but how do you how do you think we are doing as an industry as far as the instruction? Right. And I think this has been a big topic. And I ask this to a lot of uh, the people that come on here, top coaches. And I've heard you talk about it on your podcast. And there's a lot of different directions, obviously, we can go. But how do you think we're doing in like what's the future look like? I think we're doing I mean, I think I'd say this. I think we all have most of the same information now. I really do. I mean, um, you know, I, I guess if I was to say something that I don't like about our industry would be, I think that I miss the time frame where people really got mentored under another teacher and really learned their craft. Right. I think there's a rush now to get in the business to say you teach tour players. Mm-hmm. Right. Preach. And, yeah. I love that. And, yeah. and, I, and I think that, I, and I understand why people do it. And I, you know, I never got into the business to teach a tour player. I mean, I got into the business because I loved golf and one of the most couple and the, the most influential person in my early playing golf was Mark Wood. And he was the person I looked up to and idolized the most. And he was a golf teacher. Right. So that's why I wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, I didn't ever – I mean, I think as you go down the road, you start teaching better players. You're like, oh, I might be able to get this guy good or whatever. But, like, I didn't ever think that I was going to become Chris Como or Scott Hamilton or somebody that's out there a bunch of weeks. And uh, and, it, and it, But it happens. And I, I wish people would focus less on getting there and more about perfecting their craft and making people better and then see what happens, right? So who, who also, was your first tour player when you when – you- you got the, your break, I guess, to get out on tour. First, first well, <laughs> first one. I know I switched gears on you there, but no, kinda, no, that's kind of segues. That's a good story because you could. So, first one was really so Nolan Hankey. I ran into him at the beach, okay, and he was, you know, closing in on fifty a few years before fifty. He was playing golf at Santa Rosa Beach where I work. Uh, taught golf for a good bit. We built a nice teach build. My best friend, Wade Hamilton was the director of golf there. And we ran into Nolan Putton and he was drinking a Miller light. And he said, y'all want to go play? And we played nine holes and Nolan, you know, then he asked me a few questions and, you know, I filmed him and I showed him some things and we worked, you know, we worked till he kind of quit playing basically from then on. I mean, I helped him and he'd come and stay at my house and we did a bunch. So, Technically, I guess he'd be that. And then, you know, um, I was teaching a bunch of good amateurs at the time. Um, Bobby Wyatt was my first really good player. Oh, yeah. And um, Mr. And, 57, right? Yeah. I mean, and he was special, right? And yeah, he was. I think the thing I'm most proud of, though, is like, I mean, we're still really good friends. We're close. We text all the time, talk all the time. I asked him to write me a letter of recommendation for something the other day. When we hang up or text, we tell each other we love each other. I mean, he's, he's, he's a world-class guy, right? He's one of my favorite people. Um, but Lee Williams, who was a two-time Walker Cupper um, and a world number one amateur, had played – and he'd won like a zillion dollars on the Hooters tour back then when you could make a bunch of money playing mini tours. And he had gotten his tour card and – and he played on tour and then he got hurt, hurt his back. Um, and he was struggling and he had worked coming up through high school and college with my mentor, Hank Johnson. And then he left Hank and I knew he went to Scott and he went to some different people and he called me. We were friends. Cause I was like Hank's assistant when he was taking lessons from Hank in college. And, uh, he called me, he always calls me cap and he always goes cap. So he, uh, he came down to Mobile. I was at the Country Club of Mobile, where I was the director of instruction for a long time, and and uh, he uh, he came and we started working, and he and he actually did really well. And then he had this back issue. It's a some sort of a genetic deal. The short story is his back basically in the middle, where 
because it's fused. It's just over time and mm-hmm. he, can't, he has no mobility and he's got a lot of pain. Couldn't hit it and he couldn't get any speed. So he, he took a medical and then he's quit playing, but he would be the first one. And I'll never forget. This is such a good story. Cause if you know, Lee Williams, he's the cheapest son of a bitch that's ever lived. Right. And, uh, He's a money manager now. And if you've got money, go see Lee Williams because he never spent a dime of his own. But and he, <laughs> so he called me and he said, and it was actually funny because it was about this time of year because Zurich was, that was before Zurich was a team event. Mm-hmm. And he said, Hey, can you, um, can you come with me? And I said, man, Lee, I, we got spring break and I've promised the family we're going to the beach. And uh, he said, I mean, I'm, and, this time I'm on my fourth wife or close to marrying her. We've been dating. Right. So, uh, I'm like, I can't mess this one up. I mean, you can't have five. I'm already into my second sleeve of wives. So <laughs> I, said, I, you know, I said, uh, uh, you know, I said, man, you know, I, he goes, look, I'll get you tickets to the zoo tickets to the aquarium. And he's like, I'll pay all your expenses and I'll put you up. I'm like, Perfect. All right. So I, I tell him I'm my, my wife now and, Okay, you know, she she's a team, unbelievable team player. So, That's perfect. awesome. So we go. And uh, anyways, when we get done, like we're staying, I book a room at the JW Marriott right there downtown. And every time I go by the bar, I get like a $22 bottle of glass of wine. <laughs> and I took, I took the family to eat at one of Emerald's restaurants at, no, at uh, NOLA. I mean, I mean, my expense tab was off the roof, right? <laughs> yeah. And I, when I sent it to him, damn, Captain, <laughs> what the hell? And you know, and it was so damn funny. And he still gives me, he still gives me shit about that. And uh, I actually owe Lee a phone call, but uh, and we're still friends, right? Um, and I think that's one of the beauties is about about it, right? Is that we're still friends. But so that was my start teaching tour players. And you know, Bobby, Bobby came out of college and turned pro, and you know, and then. You know, that was my first experience getting fired, right? You know, yeah, and we all get it. Right. And that, that, one hurt, that probably hurt <laughs> most of all of them. But then he came back and, and we, he came back to work and we've been great friends. And, but we stayed good friends through that, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I always pulled for him. And, um, you know, uh, so, so it's interesting. So that's it. That, that was my start on tour. That's awesome. So let, let's dig into that a little bit because I know you've talked a lot on your podcast about, life on tour and then, you know, how it is to teach those guys yeah. to, to work with them and then mm-hmm. how it is to, to, to lose those relationships a little bit too. Right. So, right. I know you, you're, you run in the same circles that I do with a lot of the guys that are teaching out there full time. Who are you working with currently? I guess is probably a better well, place I mean, to start. You know, so last year I got fired by everybody. I mean, you could have fired me. Right. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, and it's part of the business. And I, I right. said this, I said this today, I work with a, a, a tour player that first time South Florida, we had known a while. And I said, you know, I think in this business, you either have too few or too many students. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you know, and I think that's part of the business. Right. And I think I've got to get better as a person at, at separating my self-worth and feelings from how they perform and getting fired and understanding that's part of it. Right. Uh, and understanding that, you know, that, that, that just happens, but, you know, I, 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 but one of the, you know, lots of good things, good things always happen at the end. Right. If right. You, if you do stuff the right way and, you know, what got me to where I had, where I was known, if you'd say like, was that I developed a bunch of good young players mm-hmm. and then, and being out there a bunch, you get where you're kind of away from that because you can't teach the guys that are playing in a tour championship or whatever and do, go out 20 something weeks and develop a bunch of young talent. I mean, it's hard. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I, you know, so I, and I have, a, I had a great assistant that was under me for a good while at, at Frederica Jackson court who helped a bunch with that during that stretch, but it's allowed me to get back to helping a lot of these younger folks on their way up. Right. So, um, you know, uh, you know, Rick Lamb who has played on tour and corn Ferry. Rick's been with me a good while. And, uh, and, and I think one of the credits to Rick is like, we didn't have tons of immediate success and it would be super easy to fire me. Right. Right. Yeah. But he's stuck there and knew we were doing some good stuff and you had COVID in there. You had all that shit. 
and now he's had, you know, he's Monday qualified in and he's a couple starts away from earning his way to Corn Ferry Finals. He finished, you know, he finished 15th at Dominican, finished 25th or something like that, 30th at Honda, and he's playing great golf. Yeah. You know, I've been helping Grayson Murray some come back. And, I and, saw you know, that, yeah, on your Instagram. Yeah, that's that's great, awesome. Great, great guy, right? I hope he I hope great. he's successful. Yeah, right. And I've I've enjoyed that. And and I've got this young guy uh that went to my alma mater, you know, St. Mary's in San Antonio where I played, um, Emilio Gonzalez. He's from a little town in Mexico and he moved, you know, we've been working for three years or so. Like this kid, I think he's gonna be really special and Swing watch looks really play. good. Yeah, right. And and he's got that little whatever that the you know that like it's yeah. Spanish, you do, right? So, um, you know, so uh, I'm excited about that. Tom Lovelady, who I've taught since college, right? Mm -hmm. Played on tour a couple years, um, you know, and then COVID happened and he was outside that bubble. And, uh, but he's, and he sat out for a year, year and a half. He didn't even play golf, right? He was working for Discovery Land Company and and now he's back playing and he got a corn fairy card and what, you know, watching him and, and stuff. So, like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Like I'm enjoying back with the young guys. I mean, uh, you know, it's fun. I think that's probably where I'm best to be honest. Yeah. I I know just looking back at my career when I was, you know, younger and I always, when I did these workshops and speaking engagements, I called myself the king of the mini tour guys. Right. So I'd get a hundred of these guys come through right? and you know, you get fired, they move on or they don't make it or whatever. And it's like, Mm -hmm. now I've got two guys that I'm working with that, have a real chance one's guy's been off and on the, the tour and then another guy that i'm sort of developing like you're saying and i think it the my style has, has changed a ton obviously you got a lot more information but it's like you give them a lot less you do a lot more coaching so a good question would be like how do you feel like your your teaching and coaching has evolved from when you were in the early days to now and like what have you learned from that and so i share with the coaches this will probably be different than other people. Like I'm trying to get back to more how I coached and taught when I developed guys like Bobby and Robbie Shelton and some of those guys. I think maybe I did a better job. I think maybe I fell in love with the information a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm trying to get back to some of that. And then I, you know, if anybody follows me on Instagram, they know shit. Like, I mean, the biggest influence on my teaching in the last eight, seven, eight years has been Colby Touye, right? And uh, um, and his and the stuff he does with the body and the fitness and us working right. together uh, has, you know, and it's been cool because, uh, you know, as I look back on my early stages of development and the stuff I did working for Hank Johnson and you know, HJ was way ahead of his time with the body and how it moved. And, you know, he did a lot of stuff with Alabama sports medicine and research back in the day that, you know, hell, I didn't know what the hell he was doing, but now I look back on it. I mean, he was doing, I I wished he was around now to see some of the stuff Colby's doing because it's very similar. So, you know, my work with Colby has, I don't, I think it's reinforced a lot of the stuff I taught and, I try to keep it simple. I mean, people ask me all the time, what do I teach? And I, and, uh, and I say like, I, so I, I mean, look, I think if we can get the face square or relatively square on the plane and you can turn back and through and get the low point in front of it, like we're pretty good. That's pretty good. Right? Yeah. And you got to learn to chip and put your ass off. Right. Right. And, and, and then I, you know, and I think if we could teach you to do that and obviously there's, you know, when you take over a tour player, it's different because they're mm-hmm. already really good. So when you take over a tour player, I think you're trying to figure out why are they really good and what can we do to just make that better? And so that's, I think the, the fun thing about that is like putting a puzzle together and the competitive side, trying to figure that out. But when you're teaching young players and you're developing players, I mean, I think if you can basically take that concept and then if I can take them to their, and their ability to do that, and I can get Colby to get them to do it bigger and faster and stronger then I think, and then they can chip and putt. They'll be a pretty good player. Yeah. That kind of leads, leads into the the stuff you're doing. I think is super cool with your team, your team coaching. Um, Shout out. Love to be a part of that, by the way, if you ever, ever have an opening, but I'm I'm really anytime we're always, I mean, that's all we do really. 
you know, and I, and I think to not to take your question, but like, you know, the team thing, lots of people come hang out. Right. And, and it's very informal. And, uh, but I, I just don't think any of us have all the answers. Right. No doubt. And yeah. if you were asked me to say we're teachers, I think we got a lot of people out there that know the answers before they've heard the question. Okay. And, and I think that, um, you know, I think if I can put Colby and I can put Greg Carton and myself and Wayne Flynn, you or whoever is hanging out with us. I mean, I think we got a better chance to Dr. Scott Lynn has been great to me, right? He's a good Amazing. friend. Yeah. Right. And he's so smart. Right. And yep. so like, I've tried to surround myself with things that I'm not very good at. Like I'm not great on the science side. I mean, if they ask me, I tell them that. Right. Um, you can look at me and tell I'm not in the gym. I mean, my buddy always says the only time I ever go to the gym is when they give away free donuts. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, um, I think if you surround yourself with good people and people that are better than you at things that, you know, the things you're not good at, you become a good team. I think 100%. the key to being a good team is people knowing their lanes and staying in their lane and knowing their roles. Yeah. And that's where I think, and I've not always done a good job of that. I've had people and I've had agents that meddle with that and I've, it, it never works. Right. Like, you know, I need to teach and I need to be in charge of that program. Colby needs. To, and the, I think the reason we became such close friends is he thinks the same way. He was the first fitness person I was around that came to a lesson with me and asked what I wanted the player to do. And if I said like, well, I want this guy, I want this guy to be able to, I want him to not stall going through it. Okay. Well, that's all he worked on with that guy doing exercises and bands and different things. Yeah. Like he didn't go, well, we're going to do this band exercise so he could do this. That. And I was like, well, shit, I don't care about that. That doesn't, you know, he, he was the first person that ever did that around me. And so we're really big on staying in your lane. Right. And I think that's important. And uh, I think that's something if we talk about it, other teachers need to learn if like, but if, and, and I've been the other guy, like Brady Riggs brought me in with a student of his Brandon Hagee for a year. Yeah. And that Brandon, right. And yep. Brandon, Brandon had a great year, finished 82nd in the FedEx list and then fired me. Right. But, <laughs> um, but you know, like I knew my role, right. When we started, like Brady was in charge. So like they asked an opinion and I ran it through Brady. Like, here's what there I see. Go. Here's what I see. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I think we need more of that in our business, the people that understand their role and understand the way things are supposed to flow. And I think that goes back to like every, you know, I mean, you, you know, I think I, I don't know that everybody does things the right way in our business. Right. I, yeah, it goes back to that original question. If it if it's all about the player, then it does. Right. So it mm -hmm. takes the ego out of the coach. And like you said, there's got to be a. You know, if you look at the scenario where even if you've got a couple of teachers that are sort of collaborating, mm -hmm. you don't have those conversations in front of the player, right? They've they've right. they've got to have they've got to have that filter, and it all has to come through whoever's in charge. Yeah, you know, whether it's their their fitness professional or their psychologist or whatever, or right? Whatever, Everybody's right? Gotta yeah. be on the same page, 100%. and there's got to be one person in charge. Yeah, right. That's I, it's, it's like. It, to me, it's no different than being what we do if you're with a tour player. They all have teams now, right? It's no different than being the head coach of the New Orleans Saints, right? I'm a Saints fan. So it's no yeah. different than being Sean Payton or Dennis Allen. Like, I mean, I mean that, you know, the line coach isn't going out there and telling them what, what they're going to run. Right. I mean, there, he isn't going to make a decision without the head coach knowing. And I think that, I think that, I think that's a key to being successful. And if I was to say like one thing that's helped me and allowed us to help people and we've made people decent is that I think we have a team of people that know their role and stay in their lane and all, and, and you said it, you know, a minute, minute ago, if you, if you do that and, and you, your main concern is making the player better, everything else takes care of itself. Yeah. The flow of information comes cool. out, you know, correctly mm -hmm. and, you don't you don't confuse the player just to make yourself look better, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so talk about your retreats. I think that's super cool too. I can't even tell where 
like you work because you're like, so yeah. you're all over Shit. the place. Yeah. Doing stuff. My wife, nobody knows, you know, <laughs> so, talk you about know. how that came about and like kind of what you do and then how other kids or coaches can get involved. Yeah. So, I mean, I started it, I started doing junior camps. Shit, probably 10, 12, probably 12, 13 years ago. Right. And they were mainly juniors. Uh, and then, uh, and they would be bigger. Like they were probably 12, 14, 15, 20. I mean, and they were pretty traditional, but like I, but that's where I started with the team approach. Right. And, uh, you know, I would bring in Wayne Flynn or I'd bring in Mark Wood and I would, I, I, you know, in my early ones, Brett McCabe was starting out. Brett and I came up together through working with Hank Johnson. And, and so Brett did a lot of my early ones and, um, you know, uh, then it morphed into, you know, I, I was very fortunate. I had the opportunity to go to Frederica for a couple of years and it didn't work out and it wasn't the right place for me, but you know, that wasn't a place you could bring 15 or 20 people. Right. right. And, uh, so we were doing like eight, 10, whatever. And, uh, and then we, we also, then somewhere in there, we decided to let anybody come and, and it was, uh, it was cool. We have, we'll have, 40 year old guys that are mid ams. We'll have a couple people that are 10 handicaps and we'll have some kids and college players all mixed together. And we all go eat together. I think that's big. I'm big on everybody eating together. I think that it's just like, I mean, I think the more you can sit around a dinner table together, that's when the good stuff comes out. Right. right? And I think, I think it's good for young people to see how adults function and the way they operate and the way it is to be an adult. And I think it's important for adults to see how kids still are and how they still enjoy and they love things. Right. And they, and that energy. And I think it's great for good players to teach younger players or players that aren't as good what they do, because I think when a tour player or a college player has to verbalize what they do and say what they're doing, they actually have Mm -hmm. to think, what the fuck do I do? Exactly. Yeah. Right. And I think it's good for them. So I I love the fact you make them journal as well. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, I mean, and I, and I think it's big. And so, uh, you know, so that's how the retreat started. And then, you know, and then when I left Frederica, I didn't didn't necessarily know what I was going to do. And, and I got great advice from Greg Carton, Dr. Carton. And, I, I you know, I, I left there and I, I, you know, didn't necessarily know. I had I had my teacher. I have a wonderful indoor teach facility in Mobile. And I have a great place down the road for me. Um, the preserve that's a great Jerry Pate golf course with a casino 30 minutes away that I can go teach people outdoors and I can go to Montgomery Country Club a couple hours up the road and I teach a bunch of people up there but like I didn't necessarily know I mean I didn't have like a home Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was going to do and and Greg said look you're one of those people that's always going to the next thing that's that's how you are right next all right what's next and he's like you need to take a year and not do anything and not commit to anything and figure out where you really want, what you really want to do. And so I've been fortunate. I took a year and, uh, when was, how long ago was this? Right at a year. Okay. Right, so this right, is, you're in it. About a year. Right? Okay. That's why and I so, can't figure out where you are. <laughs> so, you know, during that year, uh, you know, a few months after it, I was, I'll never forget, I was driving down I-10 and, and I'm good friends with Kevin Kirk, who I think is one of the most He's brilliant teachers. Awesome. I'm right. Well, got it. Yep. Brilliant. Every time I talk to him, I feel so dumb, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, like, shit, why didn't I think the same? Well, one of my favorite yeah. favorite podcasts ever, we met at the PGA like Teacher of the Year Summit. Mm-hmm. And I felt like we were like been best friends for a hundred years. It was just the coolest. Yeah. Right? He's, he's, yeah. And he's a great human, you know. He is. So, you know, when I left where I was and and I just and and I taken a year off, I was driving him and uh and he called me, we were talking and I told him, and he said, Hey, you know, he, he partnered up with Rick Smith down at Doral. Right. And he's like, Hey, you know, why don't you come hang out with us? And I think Kevin's same as me. He likes collaborative stuff. And, uh, you know, I was like, man, I never thought about that. I was like, all right. So, you know, they got their situation figured out. And, and then I, I started bringing people down in November, December. And, uh, I think it was December was first one. And, and, and so I've been going down there and hanging out at Doral at, at Rick's place. And I mean, Rick has been, you know, Rick's an icon in our business. Right. And 
I mean, it's hard to find anybody that's been better and nicer to me. Like he is, he is a cool dude, man. And he's been awesome. And so I've been able to go there and I've done some, I've done some projects and done some programs with, with Kevin. And we've had a lot of fun doing that. And I've brought my band of misfits in there and done our programs and, and we've had a ball. So that's kind of where I am. And I'm teaching out, you know, I'm, you know, if people ask, I say, like, I'm teaching most of my tour player stuff and my high end developmental stuff down there at Rick's place at Doral. He's been great, okay. you know, and, uh, and it's been great for me. It's been good for me. And I've done the director of instruction thing and you, I know you've done it and, and I've been at the high end, nice, it. <laughs> the high end nice club and, yeah. you know, and, and I've done that. And that doesn't mean I wouldn't ever do it again. Um, you know, I don't know. Right. But I'm enjoying this phase of being a little bit of a free agent, being able to do like this summer's crazy. I got asked to go do one, something in Chicago and I'm going to do a day in New York. I mean, what the fuck am I doing in New York? Right. Like, <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, uh, and I'm doing, doing one up in New Jersey two days and I'm like, shit, I mean, this is kind of fun. Yeah, right. Funny. You know? And yeah. so, uh, you know, so anyways, my, I always joke, like I joked during the year that I was semi-retired, right. At 50, but I got too many bills in a second house. I can't do that. So no, it's um, just a new chapter. Yeah. So I'm enjoying it, you know, so, uh, and I'm enjoying that, but I'm, in, I'm internally grateful to Rick and to Kevin for giving me the opportunity to bring what I do. And, and, and unlike lots of, and I can't even say I would be this way, but what you would call big time teachers, teachers that have had huge success, one majors, they've let me come in and do what I do. They've never once told me how to do it. You can't do this at our place. This isn't going to work. Right. I mean, it's been phenomenal. And they got Josh McCumber teaching and running the thing. And Josh has been unbelievable. Um, so it's cool. And, I, and, and I'm very, you know, like I said, like for right now, like to me, I mean, it's kind of a cool thing. I mean, you got a legend in Rick Smith, right? An icon yeah. who's like the stories and the information that he can give you has been phenomenal. And he's, a, and he's an all-world fun person. And you got Kevin Kirk, who, I mean, you look at what he's accomplished and how brilliant he is. And, you know, and then you got me just hanging out like and you, then they've got a, and they've got he's and Rick's got a really nice staff of young teachers coming up. Uh, there's a young guy, uh, you know, there's a young guy there named Jackson and, and Gail. I mean, they do a great job. And, and uh, you know, it's fun. It's kind of fun being part of that. So now mm -hmm. where life takes me from here, I don't know. Yeah, uh, that's, that's all right. That's kind of but it's kind of cool for me right now. So let's talk a little bit about technology. Right. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to a lot of people that have spent time with you and oh boy. And we and we <laughs> Who the hell did you reach out to? Dude, I do my research. I'm not gonna tell you. But uh we've mentioned a few already. But one of the questions was what you learned about using balance plates or you know, pressure mats. I know you swing cat a lot and I use mm -hmm. body track and swing cat. So just I think and we can you know, we can really yeah. dive into technology as far as like <laughs> Measure, don't guess. I heard that right. Jesus talk about that before. Meaning, meaning that obviously you, we can measure stuff. Right. And I'll, I'll preface this the question with what I, I don't. What I, wrong. Hold <laughs> on, keep talking. Keep asking. I'm getting the All right. I've been problem. trying to let you talk. Hold but on, yeah, yeah. On. No, you're good. We can edit it out. <laughs> It'll be a good one. Tony's got it. Tony's got to gear up here. Don't edit this part out. <laughs> okay, I won't. I mean, so, go ahead. I can hear you. So <laughs> I've kind of lost my train of thought. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing so hard now. But, talking about force plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So connect. here's all right. So here's here's the thing, and I and I'm big on technology, as most people know. But we're still the coach that delivers the information that we get when we measure stuff, right? It's not about like, it drives me crazy when people talk about tour averages. Like, For sure. So I had a student the other day that big on, and he probably listens to this podcast and know who he is, but cause he listens to all my stuff and <laughs> he listens to your stuff and everybody else. But he said, well, he should go back to you. Right. No, no, he's, he, 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 okay, well, good. Then he's he, not a he works guy. with me. No, no. He just listens to all the stuff. Okay. But anyways, he goes, K Vest told me 
this is what he says. Kves told me that I had such and such. All right. So when a player says, or a coach says that a piece of technology tells them something, then that's a problem, right? right. It's up to us to decipher the information and give them what they need. Mm-hmm. Would you agree with that? hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, so talk about what, so what I would say is we, we all have preferences, right? Whether we like it or not. Everybody or we say, does. Exactly. We all have, so that's why I hate the, I hate the question about what's your philosophy. I got that the other night at dinner. It's like, shit, my philosophy here's, here's what I believe, <laughs> here's what I believe in. Right. Mm-hmm. And here's, but again, it depends on who's standing in front of you. And, and that's why I love, you know, kind of our players all kind of look different, right? We're not mm-hmm. teaching mm-hmm. the same stuff. Yeah. So talk about what, what, what technology you, you, you use mostly and then kind of we can dive so, into like what you believe in. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the very beginning. So when I <laughs> when Hank Johnson hired me, him and Wayne Flint sat me down and I had no car. My car had been repossessed. I borrowed a car to, for the interview. And I was making 200 bucks a week and I was living in a place with no power. Okay. You know how hard it is to pick up chicks when you have no power. Right. Like it's impossible. Okay. It's like, tough when you right? look like us. <laughs> you either got to get them real early in the day or you got to go real late. Right. <laughs> One or two. So, anyways, but um, I, mean, I had no money. And uh, I never forget Hank and Wayne sat me down at this table and I'd been teaching a year, year and a half. I don't know, whatever. This little place, sportsman. Got, I was working as a cart boy and Brian Speakman, who was the director of golf, who works for Mark Blackburn now, great yeah. guy, awesome guy, was awesome to work for. He gave me my first chance to be able to work and try to teach. And I, fuck, I didn't know what I was doing. But I remember when they hired me, Hank and Wayne sat me down at this table and they went over some stuff. And they said, if you'll teach people to turn, to get their grip on there and get their face square and to make a pivot back and through, you'll make 50 grand a year. I was like, 50 grand was like $2 million. That could <laughs> fucking pay grand, right? Yeah. And I was like, 50 grand, I'm in. I don't give a shit what you asked me to do. What else I got to do? I'll do it. So they said, do that. And so that's so that was the start. And, and, and I took a lot of criticism from other teachers around there. Like, all he teaches people pivot. All he teaches them is, you know, he's teaching the same shit, which I did. I'm not lying about it. I'm not denying it. At that point, I didn't know anything else. Mm-hmm. Right. But I was teaching people pivot to turn back and through in the limited ability that I had at the time. I mean, and I made, yeah, I was making 50 grand. I was making 70 grand. And then I was teaching more than all them some bitches and half of them are out not even doing it right. Mm-hmm. You know, doing it now. And so I don't know, you know, eight years into it or whatever it is, seven, eight years into doing that. I mean, I'm at the PGA show and I see swing cap. And, you know, I go up and uh, Tom, who was one of the founders and owners at the time, I met him. And at this time I had the radio show on XM. And, you know, they were new. And I was like, and I need this because this could show where your pivot stalls. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, at this point, I'm still teaching a lot of chops all the time. Well, shit, they all stall. Right. And, you know, and none of them are balanced. So so that's so that was the start for me with Swing Catalyst. And it was the best investment I ever made because it helped me understand. And that's also how I met Scotland. And, you know, I, and so I got asked to do a seminar with Scott, which I mean, if you know, and you've done your, I I hate standing up talking. I don't hate standing up talking. I hate standing up talking about where people are going to argue and tell you whether you're right or wrong, because that's pointless. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'm not in like, and I've been around teachers where it's like a pissing contest who knows what, like, I don't really care. As long as I'm having a beer and my people are getting better, I'm fine. So uh, I did this seminar. They asked me to do it and I was like, all right. And uh, I was going to stand up and I think I told what I did with Bobby Wyatt. And I went through this video, and whatever. And, I, and Scott was like, you tell what you do and then I'll come in behind you and I'll, he'll do all the technical stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, perfect. And so I remember afterwards, though, but that I, I was at a time where I've always been inquisitive. And I said this in something I said to I got asked to talk to the Illinois PGA a month or so ago. And I said, you know, Hank pulled me aside one time. 
and we were at the Lucky Leprechaun Bar in Orlando near the PGA show. And he said, do you want to be a good teacher? Or do you want to be a great teacher? And since he's passed, I think about that more and more. And I said, well, I mean, I mean, like every young, I want to be a great teacher. Right. And he's like, well, I'll think about that because the road is different. Right. Yeah. I was like, it is. And, uh, and I don't know that I've ever become great. And I don't know that to be honest, when he passed away that he ever was proud of me, but I know that for the years I was with him. And then when I left and the years we didn't talk as much every day, I went to the T I tried to do that. Okay. And, uh, but you know, like I was inquisitive. I was like, so why, why are these people getting better? Okay. Like why, why did Bobby become good other than he was, he was great. Right. Why, yeah. Robbie, Robbie Shelton. Get good? Why did so-and-so get good? Why did this get good? And I was like, I wanted to know if I was doing something, was I just lucky? Mm-hmm. Which is certainly 70% of guys that get really good name known is you get the right guy at the right time. And, I just wanted to know. And so I was like, well, Scott, like, cause this is, as you know, like when swing cattle started coming out, track man came out not long ago. That's like when all the science shit started coming out. Right? right. Yep. And I was like, well, Scott is the shit I'm telling them even remotely accurate. And he was like, Oh, all your stuff's perfect or great. You just mm-hmm. don't say it in the same terms as we would say it. Right. He's like, you say it in South Alabama, right? You know, and I was like, oh, okay. So that was, you know, so I got into technology by trying to figure out why people I was teaching were getting better. Like, was the stuff I telling them the reason or was I just lucky? Can I can you to- describe, not, sorry to interrupt you there, but can like yeah. to get a little deeper into that, like just use Bobby as an <laughs> example, right? So, you know, going back to preferences right. and print, you know, whatever you want to call it, like more, more than likely I can probably tell you what I don't like. Right. And what I do like. So describe a little bit what you did with him, like what you saw, like kind of what you guys worked on and then how that showed up in like pressure traces, forces and torques and whatnot. So I started with Bobby. He was going into ninth grade and he would still, I would tell you today, he still has one of the, maybe the best golf swing I've ever taught. And he's still, and, and I mean, Lucas Glover was an amazing ball striker and probably the best ball, but Bobby would give a run for his money on ball striking. It was a thing of beauty. Um, but, you know, I mean, we did a lot of posture work, and I think that gets overlooked, right? We did a lot of – got his hip posture really good and got him to turn behind it better. And, you know, he had he would have uh, – you know, he would come out of his posture and Trace yeah. would back up and stuff. You know, at that time, all I really knew was the Trace backing up and stopping, and I didn't know as much as I know now about it. Right. And so, you know, we were always just trying to make the trace better. Like, was he getting deep enough behind it? Was he balanced? And I tell people all the time, like I did this thing at Old Palm for their assistance. They asked me, they got in a swing cast. I said, first thing you ought to do is start teaching just the one or two things you understand. I think a lot of these teachers get out there and they get technology and they start using shit. They don't even fucking know what it is. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about verticals like, well, why are you talking about vertical with a guy? She's 90. Right. He ain't standing up to trying to create power. He's standing up because he sucks. Because he, right? yeah, he's right? coming in on the guillotine plane and he got to get out of the way of the club. Right? So, <laughs> so like, you know, I, I'm like, I, so I started very simple on swing cat. Okay. I'm going to teach like, are they balanced? Do they get turned behind it or wound up enough for me? And as I've gone over through time and stuff with Colby and stuff with Scott, my understanding of what's good about that's changed and refined but like the still core value of what it is, is the same. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's like pornography. We know a good one when we see it, right. Like, you know what it is when you see it. Right. And, uh, uh, <laughs> I always go back to that quote. Somebody said that, right. Like a ju- a justice Supreme court said that. So, <laughs> but, you know, I always go back to like, so, okay. So did he get wound up enough? So how do you how do you know that like what pressure like what right. sort so of numbers do you like to know. see in the track? Right. At, well, at that time I didn't know. Yeah, I mean I always kind of thought seventy eighty percent was probably good. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what they told me. Yeah, but I kind of just drew a line from the ball up. Well, did they get on that side of it? Right. Okay. Yeah. You know, and then now it's like you know, I mean, uh, doing all the stuff I've done with Scott, and obviously 
a lot of the stuff Scott's done has been with Mike Adams. And, you know, I'm not ever a big, and Scott knows this, I'm not a big front post guy. Okay. Like, yeah. I don't give a fuck what you measure. I ain't going to teach you to lean on your left leg. Okay. So, and he knows that he, he bit pissed to be saying this, but it's all right. But like, and, but I think the thing that gets lost in translation is that two things. One, even the people, tour players that are most left post or front post still get 60% behind the ball. Yeah. Yeah. The pressure but, still moves into the trail foot, right. even though that right. doesn't look like it in video. And then For, the other thing, my yeah. point is if we take a guy and we say, we're just going to leave you on your front leg. To me, that's saying that your ceiling's this low and we can't do a better job of coaching you and developing you, right? Like, that's my deal. And it's like, so that's why I've got Colby. Well, shit, this guy can't get behind it because he's not strong enough, stable enough, or flexible in his right leg, hip, ankle, Pelvis. whatever, yeah. right? Yep. So let's, let's give him exercises. And, like, if the guy comes to me and he's whatever, like, now I get, like, when I was at the country club, I had a couple guys, I mean, like, 80, 70 years old and they weren't going to practice, weren't it? Okay. So I get that. But like people really come to us that really want to get good. Right. And that's who's listening to your podcast. Right. Yes. Like, man, or teachers like, well, our job's to coach them and develop. Them. I mean, that's a, that's what we are as a coach coaches to make you better. And so like, I've always thought like, okay, it's an athletic movement. I wouldn't throw a football leaning on my left foot and go back. If Drew Brees did that shit. He wouldn't be going in the hall of fame. Um, so, you know, I've always looked at it like, okay, I want to get them more behind the ball. Now, how much has changed over the years? And uh, Yeah, like how much head yeah, movement's too much? Am I or understanding, too much before, am I man, understanding right? of that? And yeah. Scott's been so instrumental in that, right? Mm-hmm. And, then the, and then, like, ways to help them learn to do it and feel and load correctly. Colby's been the biggest influence on that, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, that's, that's my, you know, but so – Back to the original question, which I've wandered off as usual. Like swing catalyst has been the biggest technology. Um, I love my. I have. I have a track van. I've got two for a guy who uses no technology. I've got like a swing catalyst, two balance plates, two quads, a track man, and a bushnell. Right. I should sell the shit and buy another condo somewhere. But <laughs> I love the quad. I like the quad a lot mm-hmm. and I love my Bushnell launch pro because I think the player doesn't need much more information than their distances and those things in the curve. Right. It's probably good for, yeah, like a, a college player or a tour player that's Great trying to get something player. a little cheaper. I think it's even good for a tour player that doesn't get too much into it. Right. right. Yeah. Like, and it, you know, uh, and it's accurate. I love that thing. And so I've been toying around and traveling with that and, and, uh, and using that. So um, I've got a K vest. I've used it. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of good in it. I mm-hmm. would say this, and this is more for the teachers. Listen, like from a business perspective, it takes a bunch of time to put that thing on and do all that. If you're teaching an hour or two hour lesson and you kill 30 minutes doing it, I don't know that it's right. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that's the part of it. Right. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, I think 3D obviously is coming and we're doing more of it. And I've experimented with it. I've done some drag and fly down at Doral with Kevin and some of those guys. And mm-hmm. I, I think there's some real good of it. Yeah. But I, my, 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 I always go back to this. Like every time somebody says, well, it gives you what's happening and the truth is. Now, you know, at one point they thought the world was flat. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, well, how do we not know that in, I said that about track, man, how do we not know that in 20 years, they're going to find out that shit wasn't right. And we mm-hmm. ruined a bunch of players. Right. <laughs> so let's stick with shit. We know is working. Like, so that goes back to my whole deal. It's like, if the guy's getting better, the girl's getting better, players getting better, you know, I'm doing a good job. I try to not get, I think I got lost in technology a little bit. And I think I got lost in chasing to, I mean, this is more of a personal deal. Like, I think I got caught up and doing some of that. I think I got caught up a little bit being trying to be at a real nice place and fit what everybody thought I needed to do there. So I'm going back to just trying to make people better. And I don't really give a fuck if they like it or not. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to go back to doing what I did. Right. Yeah. 
I know I've found that at my new job with the demos a little bit older. Right. And I've, I've gone back to like some of the basic stuff that I used to do 15 years ago, you know, teaching people to get it, you know, like you said, get it in the air, yeah, <laughs> hit it right. solid and, and, and but it's know, fun. control the curve a little bit. Right. You know, it's, and, and, and it's just interesting though. Like I, I did a lesson, like, I don't know, it was probably six weeks ago. I went in and I said, you know what? I'm going to turn all the swing catalyst shit off. That I didn't tell the player. It was, a, it was, you know, it was like a 12 handicap. And I'm just going to do old school where I'm just going to video and draw lines and see how I do. And I mean, it was a great lesson. And I was like, you know, why don't I do that more? Right. See if I can do it. Um, so that's, you know, that's my thoughts on that. I mean, I, and I think that, you know, because I do wonder, and this isn't being old school and all that, but like, I mean, you wonder if some people could teach without it. Yeah. And I've been very fortunate. Um, I mean, I've gone out and I've hung out and I've watched a couple golf schools of Butch teaching regular players. I mean, he doesn't need any of it. Yeah. Right. It's saying, and it's an unbelievable lesson, you know, and I've watched, you know, I think, uh, um, you know, so that's, that's my thoughts on that. No, I, I agree. I mean, I think using like track man or any radar, right. like, I think it's definitely improved my eye cause I can just about, mm-hmm. you know, reverse engineer the ball flight now. And I right. I'll mess with my players and go, all right, that was path was that face was that like, how'd you know that? I'm like, I've seen millions of shots yeah but I don't need it. This is for you, right? This is for your feel through the changes or the direction that we're going, but we don't have to have it. And like, especially when you're teaching on tour, you better be pretty quick with your eye, right? You ain't got time to whip out a launch monitor. And sometimes when the guy goes, what happened? I I also think that it's okay to say you don't know. There you go. Yeah. I mean, there's been times I've said, I don't know when I did know, but they didn't need to know right then. Hey, that's the coaching right. piece. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. uh, so I, I think, you know, uh, I mean, I think that's, I, I said to Wayne Flint today, I was driving down here with my dog and, and uh, we were talking about it. I was talking about my lesson with this player today. And he was talking to me about a player that he had taught for a long time was an all American had left him and gotten screwed up and he was back and, I said, like, I think all of us have the same, most of the same info. I think the art of teaching is, you know, when you get a good player that's really good, that doesn't fit what, like what you called your preferences. Right. The art of teaching and the best of the teachers are the ones that are able to take those and figure out how to make it work. Right? That's right. Yeah. And I think if all of us, if you gave any of us good teachers or, you know, I'm average, but like average and above. You gave any of us a guy with a bunch of athletic ability that's 15 and will work hard, no physical issues, and you give us a year, I mean, you're going to produce a guy who can hit the ball good in a good golf swing, right? right. I mean, it's basic. Yeah. We, we all have the technology. We all have the understanding. Now, I think the art is taking somebody that can or can't do things or is already great with things that don't that aren't great and then figuring out how to make them better. Yeah. You know? Teaching skill acquisition, I think, and right. motor learning is the lost art. Mm-hmm. I think that we're kind of getting back into, right? With stuff like For sure. Will, Will I think Will so. doing and, you know. And I love JD. the Will Woo stuff. I did oh, some. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like Dunnigan that. again and those guys, I mean, they're doing some great stuff because it, it mm-hmm. brings you back into sort of the old school-ish, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, skill-based sort of training that I think we've, we've kind of lost along the way trying to be perfect. Agree. Uh, all Agreed. right. So before we close, I appreciate your time. Oh, I know we, we, can, we can do we can do a part two at some point because I, I got so many more questions. I've got a whole oh, page. Go Let's do. Uh, hold on. Two minute timeout for me to go pee, and then I'm gonna give you three more questions. All right. Cool. All right. Um, all right. But so so tell tell everybody who, who Wayne Flint is. Oh, go ahead. You got. No, you Wayne. go ahead. Three more questions. Pick yeah, up. I was gonna say to tell everybody because you mentioned Wayne Flint a lot. Tell him who he is, and I know he's a friend and mentor of yours, and then give us a couple of good stories about Wayne. So I think Wayne is the most underrated teacher that I've ever known of developing people and players of all skill levels. He's the best nuts and bolts, fundamental, and I know sometimes fundamentals get bashed nowadays, you know, whatever. Man, like, he can teach his ass off, and uh, I mean – there's so many great Wayne stories, but 
like most of them are bad towards me, but like the, if you get him on, you got to get him to tell you about it. like, so first time I ever filmed something for you, remember those old video cameras where you'd look down the thing and the camera be out like that. Yeah. So he handed me one. He said, film one down the line. Well, I hold the thing and I just look straight, but the camera's pointing <laughs> up there. Right. And I'm filming this guy and I don't know what I'm doing. And he goes, what are you doing? Filming the fucking space shuttle. <laughs> and I was like, I'm like Oh shit. They had to show me, but he taught me so much about, him and Hank just taught me everything about being a professional, right? And a professional in the business. And if they heard some of this, they'd be shocked. Some of the stuff we're talking about, but you know, taught me so much about that. And, uh, you know, I tell the story about, you know, I mean, when I started working for him, I mean, I had no money. I didn't have good clothes. I mean, um, that's why I like, I appreciate the stuff. Like, yeah, I've been with, I'm very, another shout out, like vineyard vine, right? To young people. Right. Like if you get people, they're good to you and take care of you. Be good partners. Don't jump to the next person every time somebody gives. So I've been with Shrixon on Cleveland Golf for. I probably should be wearing the hat here, but I was driving. But um, sorry, we're not doing video. <laughs> um, you know, been with them eighteen years, and uh, been with Vineyard Vines, I think five. And I mean, it's great. They're great. Stuff. I wear it. I wear it a lot. Company, right and. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I had no clothes nothing. and I remember like Hank brought in the first batch of stuff with his logo on and I had these new polo shirts with his logo on, had new polo shorts and shirt pants and I was so fired up. And Hank and Wayne made me take this teacher test and it was a test. There was a hundred questions and question one was you put where the grip, where you wanted the grip. And then every question after that had to correlate to where you put the grip, right? Okay. It was an old golf digest test. And uh, so I take this test and I'm certain I've aced this so much, right? Now I've been teaching, I've been teaching eight months. <laughs> and so I, you know, just got my new little condo I'm living in, you know, I'm renting and on the resort, I'm starting to make a little money. I'm doing all right, all fired up and, they sit me down, take me to dinner and Wayne pulls out this, Wayne pulls out this test and all I see is red all over it. And I'm pissed. I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> and the best part of the whole thing, Wayne goes, T, I hate to tell you this, but we need you to take that logo shirt off and leave it at the door. You're not, <laughs> you're not qualified to wear it. And I was devastated for like 12 seconds. I was like, I'm in panic. What? The fuck? You know? And he's, and then they all busted out laughing, right? You know, but uh, he, he's he's one of the great, you know, sometimes I feel bad, but like uh, I've been very fortunate to get known for things or whatever. He's he's taught so many players. He taught Brian Gay through college, Jason Duffner through college, uh, Patrick Martin now, you know, taught him through Vanderbilt All-American, uh, Jay Hobby back at Auburn that played in the U.S. Open, Ian Steele to the tour. Like he taught so many great players, right? Always taught in Birmingham. He's been at Highland Park, little municipal place downtown. I don't know that he gets the credit that he deserves for being a great teacher, but more than that, he's been a great mentor and sounding board. And, and he's somebody that I think in our business and what we do, and especially when you teach tour players and good players, like you got to have somebody sane that you can go bounce stuff off to yeah that has your interest right and that also isn't afraid to tell you when you're no i don't know that you should do this right now or no right whatever mm -hmm. and, and wayne's been that for whatever i so i'm 51 so he's been that for 31 years i've known him my first golf lesson i ever took it to from him i bounced the check to he could tell you that that's a good story oh, i was God. in college and i bounced the check because on the way home from the lesson i realized i needed beer and I didn't have enough for both, and I bought the beer. So, <laughs> I love it. Hey, Debbie, you'll tell you. Classic. My nickname for like the first five years they knew me was Checkman. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. So, uh, That's but anyway, awesome. but um, yeah. So he's been great, and I've been like, go, you know, I think you always. It's funny how when you do these things, and I, uh, I appreciate one you having me on, but because I like reflecting. But like you always look back, everyone's saying you go always go back to the stuff we started talking about. 
just yeah. been so fortunate. I mean, if Hank Johnson and Wayne Flint wouldn't have taken an interest in me and, and I would be, I would be nothing right now. Nobody would give a shit who I was. And, uh, uh, you know, Mark Wood was an inspiration and he's a great friend and a mentor. And, and then Tom Ness, who was a great teacher and yeah. he's, you know, he's struggling health wise and not teaching now with Parkinson's in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, so many great teachers have taken an interest in me and for whatever reason, I don't know. And, and, uh, I just feel like we're obligated to give that back a little bit. hundred percent. Yeah. That's where we're definitely like-minded. So one question, number two, and then you got the last one's a quickie. It's like, how was a failure or a roadblock in your life, uh, set you up for later success? Like, do you have a favorite failure that you can look back on and say, I learned something from that and it spurred well, me two. on. I think I'm a, is it okay if I give two? Absolutely. Yeah. I've got all the time in the world. I'm just, I'm no, I'm your time. Like they're, they just, they're, they're running a little behind shit. Awesome. And if she's got to take an Uber, you know what? I've been married four to three times with that. So, um, but, uh, you know, the first roadblock would have been when, and, and, and I, I think it's interesting that he's been a topic tonight, Bobby, because he was such a, so important in my career. And he also was such a good person and a good friend and a great player. But, um, you know, when he fired me, which he hadn't played his best and he wanted to get to the tour and, and he went to Scott Hamilton and, and Scott was teaching a, lots of great players. And he's such a great teacher. And he's, you know, he's such a brilliant, he's so brilliant with all the technology stuff. Like my immediate response because I was devastated. Sure. And he, Bobby, most people don't know this, but Bobby fired me the night Smiley won. Oh, wow. At a Hooters. Oh, my God. Even better. Even better that I did it at a Hooters. I should get some, I, I should get a bigger sponsorship than John Daly for that. <laughs> oh, but how, how did he do it? Like, I think that's the thing is like, well, he, he, he was, he was a, I mean, and not to get him, like, he was emotional. And he's, he's like, I'm telling you, he's one of my dearest friends. But he did it the right way. He wanted to get better, man. I wasn't making him better, mm-hmm. right? I had run out of ways to make him better. And he want, he needed to and deserved to and wanted to play the tour. And I hadn't done it. And, you know, he he needed something that at that point I couldn't do, right? And uh, um, so when he left, it was painful, Right. I mean, I'm not too proud. Like I cried that night. Smiley won, but I was more upset at that time, right? And because uh, that was like a lot of my life's work as a teacher. And uh, but so what I learned though was like I went through this period where I bought the track man, did all this shit, and I was like, I'm gonna, you know, because there were all these guys getting into that scout with somebody. I was like, I started trying to be like them. And then I realized I was worse. Right. And I was like, I got to stay who I am, whatever that is. I got to figure that out better. Mm-hmm. And I got to get better at making people better doing what I do. And if that's good enough to make a tour player or that's good enough to coach a tour player, then that's great. But I'm not going to make anybody any good if I'm trying to be somebody else. Great advice. And so that's that was good. like, that was a huge lesson for me. Huge, huge lesson for me. And then, you know, and then I think the second one is, you know, uh, the deal leaving Frederica. I mean, it was a great opportunity. They gave me a great stage to to be on. But, like, you've got, again, it's about being who you are. Mm-hmm. When everybody starts telling you, one, when it becomes more about money and more about greed than actually doing something special, it's not the right deal. And I think that, you know, you got to stay true to who you are and what you want. And so, like, that was a good lesson, like, that sometimes it's okay to walk away from something that may pay you more. And it's and and it's sometimes it's scary, right? Sure. And I'm yeah. sure you've been there in business, right? Sometimes it's scary. Um, but my, my rule, I'll never forget, I called when I left there and I said I was done. I remember calling Wayne and I said, you, and he's like, you know, and, and, I, and the same thing, I called my wife and I said, I've always bet on myself. Right. And I think that's the lesson I've always learned. 
and and I've been, and, and look, I'm going to lose sometimes. Shit, right? And this year, yeah. been a great year, I'm not ashamed to say it, right? But like, I think I've learned that you. But I think both lessons are the same. You got to be who you are, and what you do, and you got to get good at what you do. And it's either good enough or it's not. Right. And I told a really good player who I taught who won an amateur, and he's bounced around now a little bit. I was like, you got to. You got to go back to who you are, how you beat these guys and be that not searching for something magical and mystical out there. Now, who you are and how you are, you got to get as good as you can at doing that. And that's either good enough or it's not. Yeah. I always like the, the quote, Chase don't let, worked. don't let, don't let better get in the way of best. Right. Cause it, you know, it's like you, you, 1% better is the, trying to chase that next, like you said, grass is not always greener on right. the other side. When somebody fires you and mm-hmm. thinks it's going to be better. It's not always like that. How few players do you know? I mean, how many players that bounce around have gotten better? Not many, not too many, you yeah. know, tiger is the exception, right? Tiger has been great with everybody he's gone to, but he's tiger. Somebody could have yeah. taught him to stand on his head. And he'd have won four majors. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And I, But you look at, I think that we'll have a trend somewhere where people realize that staying with the people that help you and brought you up is the way to go. And I hope that's the trend that happens. I really I do. I hope so, and, too. And I hope it's less about mega teachers and super teachers that have 20-something guys and, you know, and I look, I've benefited from having a bunch of guys and I mean, shit, it bought this house. Right. But like, you know, in the end, like, I man, I wasn't any better than anybody else. I'm just trying to help you get better. And and I think if right. people understood that, I think if people got back to that, I think we'd be better off. All right. Before I ask you the last question, since you got a little bit, a minute, just the advice you would give to the young coaches out there now, like, uh, like that varies okay. for, for everybody mm-hmm. that I've asked on the podcast, like, what would be the roadmap you would give to a young uh, coach or a PGM student that says, I want to teach for a living? What would be the roadmap? So my advice would be to find somebody that's really good at teaching and go work for them for a few years. I don't, and I know that, and there's, a, I'm, I'm sure you've had a bunch, because you've had so many of the great teachers that they would all say different things and a bunch of them might disagree, but I don't know that, just going and getting a track man or a quad and a force plate and setting up shop is the best way to become great. And I think, I think everybody needs some foundation to fall back on and to be a base that you build off of. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I would tell every young teacher to go find somebody that'll give you the opportunity. And you may not make much money, but like you shouldn't be getting into this because you want to make a bunch of money. And also with the note that after you've taught with them for six months, you're not Butch Harmon, right? So go, but like go work for somebody for a few years. I I was Hank's assistant for like eight, nine years, you know? And, you know, and I had people, oh, you should go do that. I mean, like, you know, I make decent money and I mean, I learned so much, you know? Um, So I, I think that would be really good. I think go find somebody that's really good at their craft I mean, look at all these other businesses in the world. Like, look at all the other things where people are, they, like, they go learn their craft first. Yeah. You know, I think that would be good. That'd be, I think that would be good advice. And then never think that you have all the answers. Yeah. Be open minded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, I know certifications are, are big nowadays, but I think, I mean, the yeah. internet is like, you've got the information is there if you search hard enough, everybody that's listening to this is do sweeper certified. I'll send you a receipt. I'll send you a certificate. You can hang it on your wall <laughs> and guru certified. And I don't even have yeah. one. So right. This, I, mean, I, I don't even know what do sweeper certified. You'd have to be able to drink one rum. Yeah. One Coors light. Still talk. There you go. Awesome, man. All right. Last question. If you could have a gigantic billboard and get a message out to the world to billions of people and put it on your billboard, what would your billboard say and why? Is it about golf? It can be life golf. You can have multiple billboards. Like it's, it's an open wow. message to the world. What's the, the do sweeper, the Tony Rosario mantra quote. Just life. get better, get better today. Okay. You know, I mean, I think if everybody, the one thing, so I, I don't know where I read this 
probably on Twitter or something. But like, you know, I was traveling and you know, about I started this few years back, like just speaking to people like and saying something nice, just taking time every day to say nice, something nice to people and hello and ask them how they're doing. It's amazing the reaction you get and how people react. Yeah. Right. And stuff like this isn't a billboard, but like, I mean, when you get done in the, in a grocery store and you get your cart and there's four carts, pick the, if you don't have anywhere to go, pick the four other carts and put them back thing and where they're supposed to be or take them up there. Like, I mean, just do something nice every day. Yeah. Hold a like, door for somebody. I'm a, like a chronic right. door holder. Like, yeah. Hold the door. Yeah. Like, you know, when you're walking into a place and there's somebody and, you know, and they're trying to get like, Hey, how are you doing? Not, I mean, like, just be nice to people, you know? I love it. I, I, mean, I think that, I think that's more important than golf, right? Especially and nowadays. We'd be, we'd be way better off if more people did that for hey, sure. We're, it we're doesn't in- matter which side of the spectrum you're on political, whatever, like, right. man, we, we need more people to understand being nice. Yeah. We, we just need to get along, don't we? Yeah. No, no kidding. So, all right. So important question for you, give everybody their, your handles and how they get a hold of you. Cause Brady Riggs gave you the challenge of, are you on TikTok yet? Cause I'm on TikTok I'm on it, now. But I haven't posted a video. That <laughs> son of a bitch. I knew you got that. <laughs> so we've got to get you, we got to get you going on TikTok. The dude sweeper on TikTok. Is gonna, I mean, I got a TikTok. It. I don't know really how to do it. And I'm always afraid I'll start dancing or something on it, but you don't have to dance. We're just doing golf stuff on there. But um, it's, pretty, it's pretty funny. So the way to find me, so the thing I'm most active on is, is Instagram. Cause I, yeah. you know, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy putting shit up. I enjoy taking jabs at people that piss me off. So the at the do sweeper on Instagram or at do sweeper golf on Twitter, but, but you, you know, shit. Uh, uh, and if you're a golf instructor, go to a uh, golf coach development page. And I, and I think of all the things and we, we touched on it, but like, the thing I think I'm most proud of that we're doing is that page that Justin Parsons has been a prince and has become such a good friend and sounding board uh, for me during this past year and a half. And, you know, we've got 530, 40, 50 young coaches. And like we had Kevin Kirk on last this past week. Like um, it's awesome. It's fun. So if you're a young coach, go follow it. We do fun stuff. And, you know, I mean, we need to have you on there. I mean, like, it's fun. I mean, it's, and it's good. Right. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, and, and I've also gotten to know coaches I didn't get to know, like Jason Bale and, and you know, getting to know you here. Like, mm-hmm. I think we get caught so caught up sometimes in all the stuff we do day to day that we don't take a look around at what's going on. Absolutely. So, My man, I yeah, hope uh, I can call you a friend now, Day. And, you're kicking ass, man. You're doing great stuff. Uh, yeah. You're kicking ass. Keep doing it. And and like I always say, like, I think if you do stuff for the right reasons, things turn out for the best. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time. It's great catching up with you. And absolutely, keep keep killing it out there. And uh, we'll talk soon. What's up, everyone? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you jump off. First, big thank you to Tony for coming on the show and sharing his story and his incredible knowledge and insights on coaching and just so entertaining. It was a really, really fun conversation, so I appreciate him coming on. Make sure you go to the App Store and download the Golf Guru app. And also give me a follow and reach out on Twitter or Instagram at Golf Guru TV. Also check out my website at golfgurutv.net. We can find videos, articles, and more information on my teaching and coaching. If you have a question or a comment for the show, email the show at golfgurushow at gmail.com or hit me up on the DM. Also, thank you so much to our sponsors, envidhemp.com. Uh, if you use the code guru20, you get a 20% discount for life for all your CBD needs. Check it out. And also to Swing You and my marketing team, you guys are awesome. I appreciate you. Music is by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And as I always leave you, RIP Mr. Roan, Mr. Jim Roan, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next time.